The nation's contribution to ecological disaster by war and financial greed calls for ecological measures is used to stage globalism. This is the opportunity for the papacy to come in as the moderator, as she does on so many points, whether it be on finance when the financial crisis was there, whether it be the moderator in disputes, or bringing the churches back to the fold, ecumenism, espousing her own times and laws. The agencies of evil are combining their forces. Not only her, but spiritism that is joined to her. And those ideas and thoughts that come from communism, evolution, have never passed away, but are in the hearts and minds of men and continue to the very last time. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements shall be rapid ones. Right from the very beginning in the book of Job we are told that God has stored up his treasures for the last day. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? What has he done? He's reserved them against the time of trouble. The time of trouble is that time in which we are entering against the day of battle and war. Anyone of popular notoriety is ready to listen to the papacy. Politicians are known for compromise. That's how they come to power. Again, an address, an open invitation to speak, some date to be confirmed, meeting of Congress, in which the Pope will address this country. This is different to former days. This is not how it used to be. But the door has been open wider and wider since the days of Ronald Reagan. He has lived his values and upheld his promise to be a moral force to protect the poor and the needy, to serve as a champion of the less fortunate and to promote love and understanding among faiths and nations. Extending liberation theology is really what was happening worldwide with the media overflowing with favourable reviews. Any show of humility is published as great evidence of the Pope's benevolence. Yet if benevolence was truly the way of Jesuitism, they would not have been expelled so many times in so many countries around the world. The foundation of the movement that led to the expulsion was sabotage and espionage. The deadly wound is truly healed and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Revelation 17.11 Jesuitism is the answer to this riddle. Pontifus literally means bridge builder. That's the work that the Pope does. Using the Christian name he builds between different faiths, a compromise for his power base. This is how Greek philosophy become the body of the beast. In the countries of the world there has been compromise. Church leaders have compromised in every denomination. As with the Lutherans and their talks with the papacy to meet a common ground in which there is no common ground for truth. But I believe great people will come from this country as would be the case in the USA where great light has been shed as is in the case of England and Scotland and Ireland. Great people in the last movement will come to shed the light of God's word in the world. The gap is closing between that which made up the Reformation as the leaders go into the papacy's fold. And there is a commitment, as the Pope has said here, to spiritual ecumenical movement of which he is the leader. I believe it is truly important for everyone to confront in dialogue the historical reality of the Reformation, its consequences and the responses it elicited. So how prudent, smart is it to confront the issue rather than sweep it underneath the carpet, but particularly because Protestants are coming into the Roman fold 
Catholics and Lutherans can ask forgiveness for the harm they have caused one another and for their offences committed in the sight of God together, we can rejoice in the longing for unity which the Lord has awakened in our hearts and which makes us look with hope to the future. Pope Francis addressed to the Lutheran leaders. What are they doing there? Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope meet. In address after the meeting, the Pope said, Catholics and Anglicans should work together to challenge secular society, especially on subjects such as the sacredness of human life or the importance of the institution of the family built on marriage. Both leaders remarked on the coincidence of their March instalments. Francis celebrated his inaugural Mass on March 19, two days before Justice Welby was enthroned as Archbishop of Canterbury. How different is this Archbishop of Canterbury to Cramer, who led out in the reform in England, who died at the stake, who gave his life for the cause, and led the young king, Edward, in the reform. Before the meeting, Archbishop Welby and his wife, Carolyn, were expected to visit the tomb of St. Peter beneath St. Peter's Basilica before stopping to pray at the tomb of the blessed Pope John Paul II. You've got to gasp at what's going on. Leaders particularly the Archbishop of Canterbury, leader in what? To where is he leading the fold? To where are the church leaders in general leading the fold? Back to Rome. Speaking of the importance of the family in his address to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Pope said this, if anyone is gay and he searches for the Lord, and has good will, who am I to judge? Francis told reporters speaking in Italian, but using the English word gay. That sounds good for the times in which we live, and we consider it in all the uproar of priest activity, inappropriate priest activity and pedophilia, and talking about the institution of marriage. Francis' words could not have been more different from those of Benedict, who in 2005 wrote that homosexuality was a strong tendency ordered towards an intrinsic moral evil and an objective disorder. The church document said men with deep-seated homosexual tendencies should not become priests. So we see that the bridge builder, or what we would call a shape shifter, to the times for popularity and for power is what is occurring right here. 2012, led by Ian Greaves, the priest at St. James in Darlington for 23 years, 58 parishioners will formally join the Ordinariate, the body set up by the Pope for disaffected Anglicans. They are not alone this week across England. 200 Anglican worshippers and 20 clergy will cross over to Rome. Many are frustrated by the Church of England's move to appoint women bishops. The protest, we're told, is over. But the protest is only over for those who disregard the commandments of God. Notice the history by Tony Palmer. Steps taken by the churches to unify with Rome. 1999. Lutheran and Catholic churches brought an end to the protest in a signed declaration. And so they meet together. The Methodists also met and signed a common declaration with Rome concerning the Gospel. The Anglican leaders, they joined in unity with Rome. Hitler also called for unity of Catholics and Protestants in his speeches. And while a totally different situation, the outcome and the result in the end will be the same persecution of those who wish for liberty of conscience and want to keep what God has declared as his commandments that are to be kept as loyal Pope to Pope Benedict, he said to all the charismatic leaders, charismatic Catholics, publicly, he said this in Italian to them. He said, you charismatics, you are the hope of the church. Stop. That's only the antipasta. 
He said, and you need to evangelize within before you evangelize outside. And when I saw that, I realized that I'd given my life to a good cause because it wasn't just some p political diplomatic maneuvering of the Catholic Church to try and get us all to become one big thing. They really wanted their people to come to faith. Um, about eight years ago, I was working for the Catholic Church in South America, in Argentina. And it's protocol when we go into a Catholic diocese, we go visit the Catholic bishop and we ask his permission to work among his people. And when I went to Argentina, the bishop that I had to visit at that time was uh, M uh, Father Mario Jorge Bergoglio. And he and I struck up a, a very intimate relationship. I have three spiritual fathers. Um, the man who ordained me a priest, Archbishop Robert Wise, 10 years ago and then later consecrated me four years ago as a bishop. He's my spiritual father. Kenneth Copeland, without a doubt, he received me in South Africa very much, so we, we connected very quickly, you and I. And Emmy and Gloria, my wife. We had good times with three victory campaigns in 99. And I remember the day before I was ordained a priest, I came to Brighton to visit you and ask for your permission and your blessing to be a priest. And you prayed for me behind the, the curtains, behind the stage, before I went off the next morning and became a priest. And the third spiritual father was Mario Jorge Bergoglio. Because you see, my wife, when she saw she could be Catholic and charismatic and evangelical and Pentecostal, and it was absolutely accepted within the Catholic Church, she said that she'd like to reconnect her roots with her Catholic culture. So she did. And so I was working in Italy with the Catholic Church. My wife was a charismatic Catholic. My children were going to Catholic school, so we raised our kids Catholic. Charismatics, Pentecostals, Evangelicals. <laughs> and it was very surprising to me when he emailed me a week before the, the election of the Pope last year, and he said, Tony, will you please pray for me because they called me into the conclave. Now, conclave is when they choose the Pope, because conclave means with a key, with key, conchiave, that's what it means, with a key. They literally locked the cardinals into the Sistine Chapel until they'd made a decision, conclave. So I was thinking maybe he had to go in there and be one of the cardinals, because he was a cardinal, to pray for the Pope. And I was on the train leaving Rome that day when they announced the Pope, and the Pope was Mario Jorge Bergoglio, my friend, my spiritual father had become the Pope. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi was an open charismatic. This is the first pope in history that took the Francis's name because he's openly charismatic. And I need you to at least understand a little bit of the, the history behind this because we are living in an incredibly important generation. I believe that God has brought me here to this year's Ministers' Conference in the spirit of Elijah. Let me explain. If you look carefully, the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers and to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons to prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that prophecy always has a double fulfillment. And we know that Elijah will come before the second coming as well. And I've understood that the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation to return hearts to each other. This is very important. We know that the first thousand years there was one church, it was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal, it doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means, you, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then from Luther's protest onwards, 
33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course, it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. And this is history that we've got a Pope who recognizes us as brothers and sisters, speaks to us as brothers and sisters, and has sent a message to us. And you'll see what the message is about. Division destroys our credibility. It is fear that keeps us separated because fear is false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Because most of your fear is based on propaganda. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. Now why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together because in the Protestant church we had a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together, we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. <laughs> but we are reformed. We're Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over.
So let me pray, and then we'll start the video. I believe we will begin to see more and more people called out to go into the world and work among the churches in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Ministries of reconciliation. We need to throw as much resources and energy into the ministry of reconciliation as we do to the ministry of evangelization. Or are we building walls without foundations? The Church of Rome is called the Mother. Revelation 17 verse 5, Then whom are her daughters? She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And again she shall fill her cup with the blood of martyrs, and God will call for judgment upon her, and for all who follow, for the mother and for the daughter. God manifests himself to commandment-keeping people. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. How will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? asked the disciple. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. These are the crucial words Christ gave to his disciples before his death giving them hope and it was in the commandments of God he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings what is he referring to the commandments that he spoke of during his life that he kept that is given in Exodus 20 made plain the only thing written directly by the finger of God that one must keep and the words which ye hear is not mine but the Father's which sent me. Now having spoken of the keys to the kingdom, that being those who keep his sayings, the commandments, who worship God in spirit and truth, who worship on that day given for a blessing to his people, now may they be one in love towards one another, John 17:11. I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. This is his prayer. And I come unto thee, Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they might be one as we are, as we are one. The division between them and the world was the keeping of the commandments in which the infilling Spirit of God would come. This was a division a marking and a marking is given again in Revelation 14 between Babylon and the true Church of God the last commission of Christ is this teaching them to observe how many all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lie on with you always even unto the end of the world he is with you if you are teaching and observing all things that have been commanded the gospel declaration given to the world, Revelation 14 verse 6, was different to that which was given by Luther. The truth had been covered by Rome in pitch blackness, was to come forward to the light, and this light was in the mid-1800s. The Sabbath and worship Revelation 14, 6 was very much part of that declaration of the gospel. True worship. A faith that works by love. And a faithfulness is in overcoming in all things. The person in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. His seed remains in him and he cannot sin. This is not an up and down experience. And it is in keeping the whole of the Word of God. This is something that Luther had not a realization of at that point. Romanism was still part of his teachings, though he'd stepped away from Rome and though he declared the papacy to be the Antichrist in the 
very strongest terms. When it came to the book of James, Luther could not correlate how that would fit in with the gospel. The gospel which he believed was justification by faith alone. But the Bible never said by faith alone. Faith works together with works by love. That is how the gospel works. And it works to bring forth with praise the commandments of God. Question. Would the Holy Spirit be given with power to a Sunday keeping people? The day Constantine used to unite Christians? Or would it be a false revival? Would the Holy Spirit be given to a people, Sabbath keeping people, but denying the power? The gospel being that Christ and Christ alone does all without uniting one's effort with that of God's. From such turn away, God will work with us. Would the Holy Spirit be given to a commandment keeping people who are prepared physically and spiritually for translation, who believe in the power of God to overcome? The same gospel has been throughout the ages to overcome, to develop character, to rely on God, turning naturally with thoughts and feelings towards him. This is the true gospel in which the mind of Christ is reflected in his people by word and by action. False revival. Sabbath keepers might think that a false revival does not include them but is on the very point of the gospel, what sin is and overcoming and what that means. And so Romanism has opened the doors to sweep in all under, under the gospel message that it has for the world. A false gospel is being given to Sunday keepers and to Sabbath keepers alike. It's not a translation message. It is not one that prepares a people for the coming of Christ. For the second coming it prepares one for the false messiah who comes to this world and Christ comes to take his people that where I am there you might be also so the everlasting gospel is not nominal Sabbath keeping it includes the new ways of worship Trinity denying the power of God to overcome overcoming is the foundational platform to every other message of salvation Therefore, the angel of Revelation 18 comes down to give power and emphasis to those foundational messages which were given in 1844, began at that time, and its development up to 1888. It gives power to the message that was placed at that time, given to a commandment-keeping people, very different to what has transpired worldwide at this point in time. I saw that God had honest children amongst the nominal Adventists and the fallen churches, and therefore the plague shall be poured out. Ministers and people will be called out from these churches before it occurs, and will gladly receive the truth. All the churches are plagued by the same problem. No kingly power is to be amongst them. You are to develop as an individual by the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the leadership should be there to help with that ministry that you have which the Lord has given ye are all brethren there is to be love for the brethren not a pretense pretense that happens when somebody visits somebody else and nobody's going out to reach each other there must be physical and spiritual healing. This is very practical. This is a preparation for heaven. This physical and spiritual healing. Physically, the mind will be cleared. Those laws were given for a reason. And spiritual healing, the mental thoughts and feelings, the environment 
must be changed to become like Christ. Remember Israel of old, it was united under the guidance of God. It was organized, it had structure, and people met together, there was fellowship. So by the last statement that I gave to you, might seem contrary to this, but you need to put it together. We need to have structure, we need to meet with fellow believers, but we need to be there in unity of one mind in truth. The truth that Christ gave to us, he said to observe all things and teach them. There is need of much closer study of the Word of God, especially should Daniel and the Revelation have attention as never before in the history of our work. We may have less to say in some lines in regard to the Roman power and the papacy, but we should call attention to what the prophets and apostles have written under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Why would that be so, that there would be less to say in regard to the Roman power because the power that will primarily ascend at this point of time which Romanism is behind is the power of apostate Protestantism so we see the papacy backing ecumenism but the one at the forefront who will bring legislation in, who will promote Sunday laws, will be apostate Protestantism. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions with papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Church and state unite to legislate an image to the beast. The beast which was and which was not in this legislation will come from the USA. So the influence of Romanism on Protestantism leading to false prophecies and theology shall be put into legislation and worldwide movement shall occur both by legislation and by the ideas carried forward from apostate Protestantism at this point of time as we said as it unites with Romanism and the result will be to bring in the Antichrist we are told the last movements will be rapid ones this is plain to see for the sixth and seventh head of the beast of Revelation 17 are already in place the UN is backing US policy on the world stage until it shall be left on its own with the downfall of the USA when the ten horns which thou sawest the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet shall receive power as kings one hour with the beast Revelation 17 verse 12 the UN in particular Germany is ready to play her part the ten horns which thou sawest the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast this is at the very end point of time. So back in 2009, Germany's constitution court had ruled that the nation's capital must, like the rest of the country, abide by the law instituting Sunday as a day of rest from work and of spiritual improvement. So the laws are sitting there waiting to be enforced and they will be enforced with a more rigid hand into the future. Unification of Germany has given back its power in the globalist scene and it's going to be a significant player in the very, very end point of time. The Superior General of the Society of Jesus said yesterday that the new media like the internet are very important to communicate the mystery of God and evangelize. These were the ones who burnt Bibles but warned citizens of the need to go with a broom when looking at religious information for in the search engine websites and there are also much trash. Google chairman Eric Schmidt admitted on Friday that the government attacks from China and the US 
You don't turn off the internet, you infiltrate it, he said, in a wider ranging conversation as quoted by The Guardian. The new model for a dictator is to infiltrate and try to manipulate it. Sunday promotion of ecology and the family. <coughs> this is at this time. Protestantism in the USA takes the hand of Romanism. National Sunday laws will follow this. This will be time to leave the cities for the privacy, for freedom, for judgments will fall. A blitz worldwide on freedom and information. The fall of Seventh-day Adventism in its popular form. Will there be a worldwide compromise as there was in the Second World War? One man particularly stood up at that time, Desmond Doss, who refused to take up arms. Others also took a stand, but many made a compromise. The other angel of Revelation 18 comes down with power. The law is emphasized and expounded on. There is the coming of Antichrist, for he is to bring everyone into his fold. Then there is no need for the coming of the real Christ. The fall of the USA for it has accepted Romanism and that will be its downfall. The beast and Europe unite for one hour. As we can see, there is the re-emergence of Germany behind Europe in the UN. And there will be judgments that will fall on the world. They are the judgments of God, the seven last plagues. Written in 1903, in a little while they'll have to leave the cities. The cities are filled with wickedness of every kind, with strikes and murders and suicides Satan is in them controlling men in their work of destruction under his influence they will kill for the sake of killing and this they will do more and more Revelation 18:16, and saying alas alas the great city that is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked in gold and precious stones and pearls look at her which city in the world is clothed like this no other city but of that woman who has prostituted herself it speaks clearly and gives us the imagery of who it is it has mimicked royalty it clothes in those itself in those things which belong to God and makes itself rich while it is espouses charity yet does not act the part of benevolence but asks others to do so while pulling in power to itself for in one hour so great rich riches has come to naught and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off they cried when they saw the smoke of a burning saying what city is like unto this great city and they cast dust on their head and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Remember, the sea represents peoples. She is traded with the souls of people. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it in the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. Therefore Christian unity is the basis of our credibility, because Jesus said until day one they will not believe. The world will not believe, as they should, until we are one. Dear brothers and sisters, excuse me because I speak in Italian, but I am not speaking English. But uh, 
I will speak uh, no Italian, no English, but carefully. È una lingua più semplice e più autentica. E questa lingua del cuore ha un linguaggio, è una grammatica speciale grammatica semplice, due regole, ama Dio soprattutto e ama l'altro perché è il tuo fratello e la tua sorella e con queste due cose andiamo avanti. Io sono qui con mio fratello, mio vescovo fratello Tony Palmer, siamo amici da anni. E lui mi ha detto di, del vostro compegno, del vostro raduno. E con piacere vi invio un saluto. Un saluto gioioso e nostalgico. Gioioso perché è a metà gioia che, che voi siete riuniti per lodare Gesù Cristo, l'unico Signore, e per e pregare al Padre e ricevere lo Spirito. E questo dà gioia perché si vede che il Signore lavora in tutto il mondo. È nostalgico perché... Ma succede come nei quartieri fra noi. No? Nei quartieri ci sono famiglie che si vogliono e famiglie che non si vogliono, famiglie che si uniscono e famiglie che si separano. E noi siamo un po', mi permetto la parola, separati. Separati perché i peccati ci hanno separati, i nostri peccati. E I malintesi nella storia, ma una lunga strada di peccato comunitario. Ma chi ha la colpa? Tutti abbiamo la colpa. Tutti siamo peccatori. Eh? Soltanto uno è il giusto, il Signore. E io ho la nostalgia che questa separazione finisca e ci dia la comunione. Io ho la nostalgia di quell'abbraccio di qua nel quale parla la Sacra Scrittura, quando i fratelli di Giuseppe affamati sono andati a Egitto per comprare, per poter mangiare. Ma andavano a comprare, avevano i soldi, ma non potevano mangiare i soldi. E lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto. Hanno trovato il fratello. Tutti noi abbiamo dei soldi, i soldi della cultura, i soldi della nostra storia, di tante ricchezze culturali, anche religiose, tra, tradizioni diverse. Ma dobbiamo trovarci come fratelli e dobbiamo piangere insieme, come ha fatto Giuseppe, quel pianto che unisce pianto dell'amore. Io vi parlo come fratello eh? e vi parlo così semplicemente, con gioia e nostalgia. Facciamo crescere la nostalgia perché questo ci spingerà a trovarci, a abbracciarci e a lodare Gesù Cristo come unico Signore della storia. Vi ringrazio tanto.
per sentirmi. Vi ringrazio tanto per lasciarmi parlare la lingua del cuore. E vi chiedo anche un favore di pregare per me perché ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere. Io prego per voi, eh? lo farò, <ride> ma io ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere e pregare al Signore perché ci unisca a tutti. E avanti, siamo fratelli, ci diamo spiritualmente questo abbraccio e lasciamo che il Signore finisca l'opera che Lui ha incominciato. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è, è incominciato. E dice uno scrittore italiano, il Manzoni, famoso, dice questa frase in un romanzo, un, om, un uomo semplice del popolo dice questa frase «Non ho trovato mai che il Signore abbia incominciato un miracolo senza finirlo bene». Lui finirà bene questo miracolo dell'unità. Vi chiedo di benedirmi e io vi benedico. Di fratello a fratello. Un abbraccio. Grazie. I challenge you to find a bridge builder and back him. Or her. I want you to video a message back. Come up here. And let's do it this way so he can see this, this whole congregation. So I've got to go to the Vatican again. Yes. <laughs> I'm really scared. My dear sir. Oh, sorry. My dear sir, thank you so from the bottom of our hearts. All of these leaders represent literally tens of thousands of people that love you, that believe God with you, and in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. And we believe we receive, according to the words of Jesus in Mark 11, 24, that whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, Believe you receive them and you shall have them. Our desire, sir, along with you, is in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Thank you, sir. We do bless you. We receive your blessing. It's very, very important to us. And we bless you with all of our hearts. We bless you with all of our souls. We bless you with all of our might. And we thank you, sir, We thank God for you. And so, all of us declare together, be blessed. Once again, all together, be blessed. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> I think you're going to have to come to the Vatican. I will. I'm available. Praise God.